Welcome to GPU June 2. Today we're talking about Art X, 128-bit dual-channel SD RAM, integrated graphics engine, DirectX 7 TNL compliant. That sounds really cool. So why am I disappointed? Let's find out. You would be forgiven for not knowing the name Art X, but I'm hoping we can change that. Like many computer graphics companies of the mid to late 90s, they were formed by a cohort of engineers and management leaving SGI in search of new opportunities. Founded in September of 1997 by Dr. Wei Yen, SGI's former vice president of products and technologies, and Tim Van Hook, a former principal engineer for SGI and the architect behind Nintendo 64's graphics and multimedia subsystems, they were quickly joined by 18 of their peers. Their first investments came early from Acer Technology Ventures, forming the bedrock relationship that would lead to the development of the Aladdin 7 plus Art X1 integrated graphics architecture that we'll be looking at in this video today. Roughly nine months after setting up shop, Nintendo would come by to see their old friends and offer a contract to the fledgling company. They had a new console in the works, Project Dolphin, and they wanted Art X to design the graphics chip, Flipper. Artex would deliberate on this offer for a brief time, but eventually decided that it was too large of an opportunity to pass on. They would work on developing both Flipper and Aladdin 7 in tandem. The combined development of two discrete architectures led to Artex bolstering their headcount, initiating a hiring spree in which they wooed over more SGI castaways to join their ranks. By Comdex of 99 in November, they had swelled to nearly 70 people, including in their roster David Orton as their CEO formerly SGI's Vice President and General Manager of Visual Computing. As headcount rose from 1998 into 1999, work on Aladdin 7 progressed well. In those two short years, the Art X1 graphics core within Aladdin 7 was shaping up to be a first-in-class desktop experience, without the desktop graphics card price tag. Flagship features such as fully integrated fixed function transform and lighting, dual pixel, dual texel, 128-bit core pipelines, and integrated multimedia engines for MPEG-2 decode and DVD playback looked to set it apart from the other integrated options, of which there were very few. Artex had positioned to set the bar for integrated graphics in 1999 very high, and at a bulk unit price of only $32 a piece, a dollar under Acer Lab's other integrated graphics solution featuring NVIDIA's Riva TNT2. The Aladdin 7 chipset equipped with Artex One graphics would make it to store shelves in the middle of 2000, a few short months after Artex had already accepted a bid from ATI Technologies to be purchased for $400 million in stock and options. Although the merger with ATI would prove to be one of the most pivotal moves by any graphics company in the fast-paced and incredibly tumultuous era following the dot-com bubble, initiating a complete upheaval of ATI's internal structure and setting a new course towards successful integrated and desktop graphics solutions. Many of ArtX's key players would take up senior management positions within ATI almost immediately after the merger to help reverse the downward trajectory of 2000. Among them, once again, David Orton, who would be appointed CEO of ATI nearly on the spot, a position he would hold until AMD's buyout in 2006. The RX story doesn't quite end there, however. As their teams and technologies improved within ATI, they would become the driving force on something you might be a little more familiar with, R300, the legendary Radeon 9700. All right, well, with that bombshell out of the way, it's time to take a few steps back. Art X1 and Aladdin 7. That's what we're looking at today, and I've already written an article about Aladdin 7, so I won't be going over the features of the platform too much, but here's a quick breakdown of what we're stuck with. Art X1 is strapped to SuperSocket 7, so we're already looking at inevitable CPU bottlenecking and platform wonkiness. To keep things somewhat level, I've paired the competing graphics options to my Aladdin 5 testbed, with the same CPU. K6 will be the great equalizer in this scenario, but obviously if I plugged these cards into a Duron or Athlon system, then we'd get no sense of how good or bad Artex is. We'd just see that the other cards are enjoying a faster platform. We're starting with Quake 3, running Demo 001 at default settings. This is an OpenGL title and shows the Artex core falling pretty much in the middle, just below Cairo and just above Voodoo 3. This is a good start for Artex, and as we'll see going forward, OpenGL is fairly friendly to this chip. 
Moving on to Half-Life results, we see OpenGL performance once again proving to be really good, matching or exceeding the Voodoo 3. But DirectX performance not doing so hot. It's falling behind the Oxygen GVX1, which isn't a good place to be in. I have a feeling the G400 Max and Radeon SDR were suffering driver or platform incompatibility issues in this title, and if they had been working properly, that the Direct3D performance of RDX1 would have put it at the bottom of the list. Deus Ex puts the RDX1 closer to the top of the chart, once again falling behind the Voodoo 3 3500, but also beating the G400 Max. Although this was very choppy performance, I constantly saw it bouncing between 12 and 15 FPS, and if you looked in the wrong direction, you'd be stuck in the single digits. I would consider this game more playable at 16 bit color, but at 16 bit, the RDX chip produces a pretty ugly image, complete with texture warping and decals not sticking to surfaces, and it doesn't make the game much more playable. The RDX1 chip puts up a good showing in MechWarrior 3, putting it above the Voodoo 3 but just below GeForce DDR. I didn't notice any screen tearing or texture clipping issues on the card, and it just seemed to work. The SAS 315 at the bottom fell out because it had some driver issues and couldn't get the game to run properly without crashing, so sadly it's not in this comparison. However, I think it would have been somewhere around the G400 Max. Our last DirectX 6 title is 3D Mark 99. Ardex falls admirably toward the top, but still pretty much in the middle of the pack. Game Test 1 performance is really good at 37.6, Game Test 2 performance is not so hot, but it still puts it in line with the other dual pipe cards in the test, Cairo, G400 Max, and the SAS 315 all within 1 FPS of each other. So with OpenGL and DirectX 6 or older, it actually does pretty okay. Although OpenGL is kind of a standout, I was really surprised to see that some games were really playable. But now we need to move on to DirectX 7 and newer titles, where it doesn't look so peachy. Our first DX7 title of the day is Dragon Riders Chronicles of Pern. Originally a Dreamcast title, it was ported to Windows, and it does include hardware TNL as a toggleable setting. RDX1 was able to work with TNL, however it showed some interesting texture smearing and weird inconsistencies, so I ran the test without it. Even without TNL enabled, you can see performance was not fantastic. While the maximum FPS does seem to elude to there being a little bit more headroom on the core, the average just didn't hold up. Moving around, changing the camera, anything that moved the screen space in any way would cause performance to tank into the single digits. Our next DX7 title is The Sims. That's right, this game is DirectX 7 compliant. I'm not sure if it's using TNL, but it certainly seems to run much better on the RDX core than the previous game did. We see maximum FPS bouncing around somewhere between the G400 and the Radeon SDR, and we see the average FPS just barely pushing up toward 40. This is another title where the RDX1 and the Voodoo 3 3500 are basically neck and neck, and I'm pretty happy to see that, because it continues to reflect more of what we saw with DirectX 6 and OpenGL titles. Our final DX7 title of the day is 3D Mark 2000. Both of these are the low detail game test results so that we can actually get some double digits to compare with. Here we see RDX1 falling behind the Voodoo 3 3500 and peculiarly Game Test 2 shows a regression in frame rate instead of an increase like most other cards. I'm willing to attribute this to drivers because I don't think most of this performance hit is from just architectural issues. However, I can't rule out anything since we have very little information as to what's going on inside the graphics chip. I would say overall performance is roughly acceptable, but considering the G400 Max and Voodoo 3 put up nearly identical results, it seems to make sense to me that you would just buy one of those and put them onto a better AGP platform than you would go and buy yourself an RDX system where you don't really have many upgrade options. Our last quick test is the fill rate benchmark. Z-Fill and Color Z-Fill show the correct responses here at 193.8 megapixels per second. Single texture and single texture plus alpha blend seem to be some outlier results that don't match up with what the core should be able to do, but without knowing what's inside, I can only make guesses. This could be an indication of three ROPs, but it's very likely that this is a software issue reporting incorrectly. 
So now that we've seen baseline results, let's do a little bit of overclocking. But if you haven't read the article, I'll give you a quick refresher. Overclocking this system is a nightmare. Everything is attached to system clock. GPU, memory, CPU, it's all there. So if you want to bump the GPU clock by 10%, 110 megahertz in this case, CPU, front side bus, it all has to follow along, which means everything has to be just as stable. Thankfully, 110 isn't that hard of a stretch. 120, on the other hand, we're getting a little flaky. So for these results, and for consistency's sake, we're sticking with 10%. Although you may see a couple of 20% overclocks thrown in there, don't expect to see many of those. I got lucky. And here's those overclocked results. Dragon Riders Chronicles of Pern, we see basically no movement at all. There is an increase, but it doesn't make the game more playable. In Quake 3 Arena, we see a 2 FPS increase, which is perfectly reasonable. In The Sims, we see a 5 FPS increase, which is way more than I expected, and I'm honestly shocked that this game scaled as well as it did. MechWarrior 3, we see a 2 FPS increase in line with Quake 3. In 3D Mark 99 and 3D Mark 2000, I want to point out these are running at 120 MHz each, not 110. These are the only two tests that could get stable at those clocks. We see 3D Mark 99 increase by 4 FPS, and 3D Mark 2000 increase by 3 FPS. So where does that leave us with Ardex? Well, it kind of just flies right down the middle. It's not good, it's definitely not bad, but when it comes down to it, it came out too late. By 2000, you could have just got a used Voodoo, or a TNT2, and we were into GeForce 2 MX territory. There just wasn't a market for this thing, which is probably why it took me almost 10 years just to find one. But it's still a fun toy, and at the end of the day, the lineage that it leads to is extremely important, and I just wanted to share. Hopefully you enjoyed. Watch the rest of the playlist. GPU June 2 is still ongoing, and more creators are going to be added, and we have more than ever, so hopefully you enjoy.